Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Trevor Morris. I'm the lead scientist of the UK Anaerobic Reference Unit, um, Public Health Wales, who's based in Cardiff. Um, and so I'd like to start by thanking the Royal College for the invitation to give this uh, give this talk. And also, um, I'd like to start with thanks to my team, um, particularly uh, Sarah and Selena, who uh, have put together a couple of these slides. So I'm going to talk to you about um, diagnosis of anaerobic infections, and these are the learning objectives. So I'm going to go through understanding when to suspect an anaerobic infection, uh, technical factors to consider, available identification and susceptibility testing methods, and awareness of clinically relevant anaerobic bacteria, hopefully. So there's a brief introduction, and then we'll go into the signs of anaerobic infection, some early clues that you can pick up on. Um, we'll go through sample transports, relevant culture media, incubation methods, and, and then follow up with uh, ID methods and susceptibility testing methods that will be available to, to you as well. And then I'll discuss some clinically relevant anaerobic bacteria, the most common ones and their pathogenesis. So just a brief introduction. So these are obviously anaerobic bacteria, organisms that do not require oxygen to grow and reproduce, um, but they do vary in their tolerance to oxygen. And so some strict anaerobes can't survive in oxygen levels uh, of less than 0.5% um, or need that to survive, sorry. And um, moderate anaerobes can tolerate two to 8% uh, oxygen. So, they, so that's an important uh, thing to consider because um, they're not all that strict, so some can grow in air. Um, most infections are caused by endogenous microbiota, uh, and there are lots of different uh, species here and genera. Um, I won't cover them all um, because uh, that would take far too long, um, but I'll cover the main, the main ones uh, that we see uh, in clinical infections. So important to consider how these infections happen. So in general, it, the anaerobic bacteria that are part of the microbiota uh, need some predisposing factors, uh, one or more of these, to be in place before they can cause infection. So compromised blood supply, traumatized mucocutaneous surfaces, for any foreign bodies um, or, or blood clots, and also therapy with uh, inactive uh, antibiotics, such as the aminoglycosides. So in terms of early indications of an anaerobic infection, uh, one that is uh, maybe obvious to most people is the foul smell and the presence of gas. Now, the presence of gas is not unique to anaerobic bacteria, but uh, the foul smell more so perhaps. Uh, and the foul smell is caused by the, um, the lovely uh, fatty acids, that are produced as a product of metabolism of anaerobic bacteria. Um, abscess formation, tissue necrosis, again, not specific for anaerobes, but could be indicative. Uh, more, more indicative are in a direct gram stain, organisms present, but no aerobic growth. Uh, and some of these anaerobic bacteria do have unique morphologies. And this is just one example I've given here, which is Fusobacterium nucleatum with these lovely spindle um, shapes in the gram film. So moving on to specimen selection, which is uh, critically important. If you're going to culture these bugs, then you need to make sure you're giving yourself the best possible chance. Um, and to do that, you need to uh, select the correct specimen. So aspirates, much better than swabs, wherever possible. Um, pus, exudates or tissue from normally sterile sites or deep wounds uh, as well. And um, urines, bladder urine, much better than anything else. And then blood cultures uh, do always include an anaerobic bottle. There's, there's plenty of literature evidence uh, indicating that uh, you would miss uh, key anaerobic pathogens if if you don't include an anaerobic blood culture bottle. There are there are several um, components of those anaerobic bottles that are critical for the growth of of anaerobic bacteria. Um, Hemin being one that's not included always. So um, we we do need um, to make sure that we 
we carry on including those anaerobic bottles, otherwise we will miss um, key pathogens. Uh, those specimens to the, to the opposite side then, to thinking about the ones that you wouldn't want to focus on. So anything um, superficial, uh, sputum samples, anything that has, you know, un, undefined microbiota already there that you're not going to um, be able to define which is causing an infection. Uh, again, vaginal swabs, skin superficial wounds, uh, voided and catheterized urine, and then anything um, from the GI tract, uh, except in the case of GI infections, of course. So on to swabs and transport media. Now, that, again, this is a key uh, consideration. Um, there are several different varieties of transport media that you can select. Uh, we found Amy's transport medium with charcoal works really well. The charcoal helps to absorb any toxic metabolites um, and so gives the anaerobes the uh, best chance of survival. Um, there are other media such as Kerry Blair and Stuart transport medium that have been designed for other purposes that do work as well. Uh, and then depending on cost and availability, you can also look at the anaerobe specific uh, transport media. Um, there's a couple, uh, there's one mentioned there specifically. Um, and then the anaerobe transport medium uh, is also available. And uh, those, those obviously give uh, the organism an even better chance of survival um, until they get to the to the laboratory. So key to that then is um, before we go on to growth media is to get the specimen to the laboratory as soon as possible. Uh, the transport time will obviously be critical in terms of uh, encouraging the bugs to grow when they get to the lab. Um, and uh, if they're delayed at any point during the process, uh, then you do risk uh, getting a lower yield um, or potentially not isolating anything at all. So in terms of growth media, then when they do get to the lab, uh, we have for many years used fastidious anaerobe agar, FAA, um, and we're now using that for ASD as well, which I'll go on to um, towards the middle of the presentation. Bruxelles agar is available. Um, uh, for initial culture, there's ARIA media as well. And th there are other selective agars or agars specifically looking for um, different, uh, different elements uh, of anaerobic bacteria, different things they, they produce that will tell you whether or not they're, they're one species or another, so it's just such as yolk agar, which you can use to, to show the, the production of lecithinase for superfringens, for example. Um, and then the, the more selective agars, uh, such as the metronidazole naldixic acid agar for actinomyces, of course. And um, so these, the details for these, uh, I haven't included in the presentation because that would be um, that would be an, an additional uh, number of slides. Um, but they are available from guidelines such as the uh, Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute CLSI guidelines uh, M56 and the um, Clinical Microbiology Procedures Handbook, the CMPH, which has just recently been republished. So please do have a look for the, uh, at those guidelines because they'll give you all the details that you need. And it, it's uh, you have to appreciate that uh, you can't capture everything, but you, you need to think about specific circumstances where you'd need to use these particular media, for example, um, the actinomyces media for uh, for somebody who ha has had a coil removed, for example, and but all that sort of detail is in in these standards. Um, so um, please do have a look at those. Um, growth media covered, then growth conditions is the other critical uh, factor. So in terms of um, achieving the anaerobiosis that's ne necessary, it's it's there's a three sort of tier. Um, approach here, so that so the starting with the very best, um, if you've if you've got the resource, it would be using workstations or chambers. Now these are you know fully fully enclosed anaer anaerobic systems that are largely self monitoring now, uh, and they allow you to manipulate cultures within within the anaerobic environment. Uh, they you know they are um, the very top end of of what you can do to 
to really make sure that you're uh, you're cultivating your, all of your anaerobic bacteria well. Um, then there's the kind of step down be below that, which is gas evacuation jars or boxes where the the gas is actually you know, pumped in from a cylinder, and and you you know you use that gas to to replace the air in in those in those chambers, whichever or whichever box or jar that you use. And then further down, then there's the the, the envelopes that, that can produce an anaerobic environment um, by once you open the, the actual uh, envelope. Uh, and, and all of those do work, um, but if you, you know, they, they would be, um, uh, if if in an ideal world you would you would want to have the very best which is the workstation or chamber um and they the key things here two key things they must be well maintained and monitored there's no use whatsoever having um a an anaerobic workstation that nobody services and nobody looks at the indicators or takes any notice of the information on the the touchscreen which is for this particular model, um, and they must have that oxygen indicator system in place. In workstations, we do use uh, resazarin as an indicator, but there are others that you can use uh, in these in the gas uh, generating or the gas evacuation jars or the pouches. There are little um, little pouches that you can use for that particular purpose as well. So do make sure that you you use one of those. So we have uh, for quite some time had a debate about uh, whether you, you should use or which is the best between biological and chemical controls. So, you know, you can grow an organism, a highly O2 sensitive organism within a within a, a workstation, for example, uh, and then if that grows, you know you've cultivated something, uh, and therefore you, the rest of your cultures should be okay. Versus a chemical indicator where you can immediately see if the situation in terms of oxygen ingress has has changed within a workstation. So um, there are pros and cons to both approaches. Uh, they I've just listed a couple of, of important factors here. Um, uh, it is it is difficult with biological controls because obviously uh, until you you don't know until the following day if if your workstation um, or your jar whatever you're using has been uh, has cultivated this organism so therefore it's a bit late to to do anything about it which is um, the advantage of the chemical indicator where you can in you know, inter, interject with uh, with whatever's going on uh, immediately, and um, so it gives you an instant visual check of the of the conditions. Uh, we we have a belt and braces approach in in the UK reference unit. Uh, we we use both, um, and uh, we we also have a workstation that uh, that tells you um, immediately what uh, what the conditions are. So uh, so those things. Um, you know, don't don't cause us any any issues. We 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 would use uh, biological control largely for the disc um, testing, which I'll mention um, a little bit later. So, in terms of identification, uh, some options here that are simple, um, and just an a, a, an example of an, an instruction uh, booklet that uh, is available that that will point you in the right direction and give you some some easy methods to, to identify anaerobic bacteria uh, if you don't have more advanced ones. So these are based on uh, work done uh, in the, the Wadsworth uh, laboratory um, and the subsequent manual that came out of there uh, probably 40 years ago now. In, and they, they used a, a series of, of phenotypic reactions and built up a profile of, of all of those reactions and some of those were specific to particular organisms uh, alongside the colonial morphology, the gram stain, the odour, etc. gives you a really nice um, guide or it takes you in a, in a direction, specific direction and leads you towards um, what that organism might be. And, and some of these are familiar to, you know, to aerobes as well, uh, catalase, etc. Um, there are special potency discs that will they'll help with that. Um, and those are still available and uh, can be used with this with this guide here. 
so so that would be the first stage um, that's available to you. Uh, and then I'm going to take you through a couple of other stages, and these are dependent on um, on yeah the availability for cost and whatever reasons. So commercial ID, ID methods, um, these are preformed. There's just a few examples in the pictures there. Uh, they they are simple, um, rapid, and relatively cheap. Uh, but the the issue with them uh, is that uh, they the databases are limited and they're not always up to date. So you do find that some of the some of the bugs won't ID using these methods. So you do have to be careful with um, with using these uh, for uh, for the confirmation of of the organisms. Um, Molditoff uh, nowadays uh, a wonderful tool that is um, available to many labs in the UK and, and certainly we use it a lot in the reference units as a screening method before we uh, before we move on to other ID methods and this is rapid user friendly um, uh, you know the databases are, are very much up to date um, we in fact we've we've provided uh, some information, some bugs to make them as up to date as we can for anaerobic bacteria. Uh, um, there, there's a few uh, nuances with the technique itself, um, whether you use direct spotting on plate extraction or ethanol extraction, uh, and you just need to be aware that you can select uh, different methodology according to the organism. Um, the, the inoculum matrix ratio is key uh, so these these are not plug and play instruments. They're not uh, ones that you can just you know stick anything in on a plate and walk away. You do have to make sure that your your technicians are skilled in in this preparation, um, because otherwise you won't get the the results um, and and it'll contaminate the instruments and cause you uh, some problems. So do take care with that uh, particular technology. Uh, 16S sequencing would be our um, ultimate uh, way of, of identifying organisms at the moment, uh, still considered the gold standard. Uh, and it does apply to a wide range of organisms, not just anaerobic bacteria, but we found over, over many years um, that we that we can we can look through these databases and we we know which which uh, which strains we can we can rely on. Um, so it does require some expertise to decipher some of these uncurated databases and some of the organisms that have been put on there are um, clearly out of out of place. So you do need to be aware of of that. So in, in terms of after identification, uh, what, what can you do in terms of uh, getting an AST result? So susceptibility testing for anaerobic bacteria has um, recently taken uh, quite a large step forward. Um, previously, the, uh, the only methods really approved uh, were the um, AGA dilution um, method and uh, gradient strips uh, but more recently we have been able to to work alongside UCAST and and produce a disk diffusion method uh, and I'll just take you through some of these uh, some of these methods now um, and just maybe go through some of the pros and cons of them uh, as to what you know what what may work for you and what might not so AGA dilution is a larger reference level um, methodology still uh, gold standard approved method by from the CLSI uh, and it, it is used by well, we certainly use it to monitor trends over time it's quite labor intensive um, and certainly not something you would be able to do on a routine clinical basis but it does give you data that's comparable across institutions and countries uh, and means that we can we can do accurate surveillance um, yeah, and we've been using that method for many years in in AIU. Uh, Microbus dilution, um, more used for aerobic bacteria, but we have we have used it comparably for some of the fast growing anaerobes like Bacteroides, um, and it, it did show some promising results. And the, and there are some commercial commercially available um, panels 
like the ones shown here, uh, and they give an advantage of being convenient, easy to use. They have a long shelf life, uh, and uh, there are some bespoke um, versions of this available, but as I said, only available, for, only suitable for fast growing anaerobes at the moment. Um, gradient strip methods, we've, we have uh, looked at these as have others. Um, and there, you know, there are some advantages here as well, similar to microbuffalation, but uh, I would say this, this uh, method is, is more widely regarded as uh, appropriate for, uh, for other anaerobic bacteria as well, not just the fast growing ones. It does give an accurate MIC, um, simple and rapid to do, and potentially you've already got these gradient strips in, in stock for your aerobes anyway. So uh, that could be um, something advantageous. They have a long shelf life and it does suit the occasional use, um, but they are expensive and, and that leads us to um, consider uh, what else we can do in terms of anaerobic bacteria. Unfortunately, now we, we have worked with UCAST over a number of years to look at the most common anaerobic bacteria and see if we can develop this testing. Um, so we started with five easily identifiable common and fast growing ones uh, and looked at a, a narrow range of relevant antimicrobial agents. And that these are the ones we've covered so far, Bacteroides species, Fusinocrophorum, Prevotella, Cebifringens and P. acnes. And these are the antimicrobials. So we covered common bugs and common and commonly used antimicrobials. Uh, penicillin, Piptazo, Mero, Vank, Clinda, and Metronizal. Um, and actually, we've found some really promising um, results there, uh, which we've published. Uh, and this is an ongoing um, process. So we uh, are looking at other agents and bugs. Um, this is the paper that we've published uh, recently. Um, so I'll um, we'll let you have a look at that. Uh, the method is based on, on the other UCAS methods, uh, but using fastidious anaerobe agar uh, rather than brucella, which is what was used previously for, for the CLSI agar dilution method and recommended by the gradient strip manufacturers. So this is focusing on, on FAA. Um, it has to be a specific depth. Uh, obviously, disc diffusion testing is affected by um, the agar depth. Uh, and we found that plates had to be dried before inoculation. So in inoculum McFarland 1, anaerobic environments and the incubation time is key as well. So this is standardized with UCAST and these bugs, you can uh, read a disc diffusion test in 16 to 20 hours, which is obviously something that uh, we haven't been able to do previously. Uh, some key factors here that are important to consider. So the, the plates, the FAA plates have to be dried uh, either at room temperature overnight or 15 minutes at 35 degrees. Um, with the bacteroides species, you do need to remove excess fluid uh, and ensure an even spread and limited number of discs are applied. And now that's more specifically for Fusobacterium and the Crophrum because they are more susceptible, more sensitive to the, the agents in question and then Therefore, you your disc applied. If you apply too many discs, uh, you would uh, nothing would grow on the plate. Um, so, as I mentioned, 16 to 20 hours incubation. And the atmosphere of the the workstation or jar that you're using has to be controlled. And this is where I mentioned earlier that we do use a, a specific um, cebuffringin strain. Um, as a as a, an indicator of the anaerobiasis for the disc testing because it gives us the comparable um, disc zone size and then we know that actually um, the tests are valid within that uh, batch so reading is much much the same as it would be um, for anything else uh, and all of these all of this information is available on the UCAST website now so please do go and have a look at that um, we are updating that uh, year on year. Um, the, the breakpoints therefore have, have changed. We have more specific breakpoints now. 
than we have had previously. And previously we were we were looking at anaerobic um, bacteria gram positive and gram negative only. Um, so this this I feel is is very much a step in the right direction um, because the, we know these bugs don't always um, you know conform in terms of sitting within a a group of a very narrow um, or using the same breakpoints isn't isn't uh, suitable for um, for all of these bugs together. So um, yeah, we are making um, really good progress with those. Um, some guidance there in the UCAS documents as well of how to do the reporting, um, and the, the, that's all available on the on the website. So the for the last part of the presentation, I just wanted to take you through some of the uh, clinically significant um, genera of anaerobic bacteria. Um, I'm only going to cover the top four here, and these probably um, cover the most the most common um, that we that we would uh, see in the lab. Um, so I will start with the Clostridium species. So anaerobic gram positive rods, um, they can stain gram variable, so you do need to look out for that. Uh, they do produce spores, and the spores, the, the location of spores, is often indicative of of what uh, Clostridia you have. Um, they can produce various toxins, and they are environmental organisms, um, so ubiquitous in the environment. So of human clinical importance. Um, these are the ones that I would say uh, are most important. So in terms of causing gas gangrene, and there's this histotoxic group, um, perfringin, septicum, sordelli, novii, and histolyticum. And then we have the most the most famous or well-known ones, probably the tetani and botulinum, the neurotoxic group, and the C. diff and perfringins, um, the more cause more the GI infections. Uh, and then there's a group of organisms that are more clinically associated. We do see them in blood cultures on occasion, uh, but but not as often as uh, as these uh, the other Clostridia. So gas gangrene, uh, most commonly caused by superfringens, uh, and I've provided some pictures here of perfringens, which is it's a unique organism in that. It's uh, it does have gives you boxcar gram positive rods and the organism on the plate is quite interesting because it confuses people to think that it's mixed but these this particular organism does give you uh, different colonial morphology um, and you can sub from one and it'll produce both colonial variants so uh, you know it's uh, it's the same bug. Um, Clostridium septicum causes spontaneous gas gangrene uh, and is strongly associated with GI malignancy. And, and we often find that culture sent to us that we culture C. septicum from, uh, that we make the, the clinical teams aware of the of the link and, the, and they, do, um, they do find uh, GI malignancy in, in some of those cases. So there's definitely an association there. It's, it's, it's well published and um, we, we're not really sure why that is, but uh, it, it is definitely a, an association. Um, Clostridium sodelli, uh, less commonly isolated, uh, but uh, has been seen in peripartum or abortion cases. Uh, so those, I would say, are the three most common in gas gangrene. Um, in terms of pathogenesis, uh, gas gangrene is the most fulminant necrotizing infection that affects humans. And the, the, the establishment, uh, the time it takes to get established is, is really um, short. Uh, and the, the actual uh, mortality rate still is high. Um, so it is a devastating disease. And that's down, you know, the, the pathogenesis down to extracellular toxins. Uh, and those toxins, those common toxins, alpha and theta toxins, uh, and again, the spores are critical in allowing uh, the clostridia to, to survive and and spread um, and make them resistant to any cleaning efforts. Uh, so environmental cleaning um, and 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 the like is uh, an important uh, thing to consider. The the spores themselves are uh, quite uh, amazing organism. Uh, part of the organism, they're, they're very much uh, the way they deal with environmental stress. Um, 
there's just an example uh, image there, uh, and the 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 fact that they can be terminal or sub or subterminal can give you an indication of what the identification of the organism is. For example, um, see tetani, you would see sodium tetanus, uh, the cause of tetanus, you would see these really um, terminal sort of tennis rackets spores, and these allow survival for for many many years. In fact, I've got cultures in the lab that uh, have been in alcohol uh, for 20 years and you can still sub uh, a strain out and it'll grow absolutely fine. Um, so, yeah, they are very, very hardy um, uh, elements of the bug. Um, so tetanus, uh, not seen very often in the UK anymore, but uh, still uh, more of an issue um, elsewhere. Uh, we we see it on occasion in in IDUs, uh, and uh, the most common presentation here uh, in the UK now is is of the um, uh, someone with a minor wound uh, who who has uh, you know doing been doing some gardening or something a few weeks ago and then develops the uh, the kind of paralysis in the head jaw area that spreads and. Um, can ultimately lead to respiratory failure. Um, the clinical diagnosis is confirmed by serology, so culture is not often attempted, uh, except perhaps in IDUs, uh, where we do sometimes get samples in. Uh, tetanus in terms of pathogenesis. So contaminated wounds are usually the, the, the kind of way in, and, and then the, the wounds itself has to present perfect conditions for germination of spores and toxin production. Uh, the the tetanus toxin itself uh, then leads to the muscle contraction and spasm and it's still estimated that one million cases annually and mortality really high uh, if not treated and it's the only vaccine preventable disease that is infectious but not contagious. So the last of the, the sort of big three clostridia, if you like, um, or clostridial diseases, uh, botulism uh, results from uh, intox intoxication uh, from ingestion of preformed toxin. Uh, there's, there's several types of, uh, of botulinum organisms, uh, and they, the the most common most common food implicated these days is actually preserved foods and the symptoms you see flaccid paralysis uh, and death due to asphyxiation in extreme cases. We did have a number of, of sort of cases many years ago now um, from you know freeform food uh, and more recently um, we've had the need to advise parents to uh, to not give an um, unpasteurized and un, unsterilized honey to young babies um, as that can also uh, allow entry of, of spores. Um, so yeah. Moving away from the clostridia uh, to anaerobic infections as a result of trauma. Um, so one, of, one such case would be surgical trauma or post-operative infection and this particular organism uh, that's most common in in these cases, uh, which is Baxteroides fragilis, and this is part of the GI tract microbiota, um, relatively tolerant to oxygen. Some key facts here: it's it's almost resistant to penicillin universally now, probably more like 98, 99 percent, um, and it can also pick up resistance to other organisms. It's it's a really um, it's a really adaptive bug that can um, yeah that can pick up resistance to to pretty much any um, antimicrobial. Um, the one of the most worrying things is resistance to metronidazole and carbapenems, uh, and we know the mechanism for this. Um, metronidazole linked with NIM genes, and uh, the carbapenem resistance linked with with CFIA, uh, but the but the picture isn't entirely clear here, in that you can have, um, particularly for metronidazole, 
the presence of NIM genes, but not the expression of the resistance. So, so uh, you, there are other elements, insertion elements that need to be present uh, before the the phenotype is expressed. Uh, so, in terms of pathogenesis, numerous virulence factors I named a few there, but essentially. Uh, just similar to E. coli in, in the aerobe world, uh, there's it also has a, an enterotoxin as well. So very, very pathogenic um, organism, Bacteroides fragilis. Um, another gram negative, now that uh, people um, most uh, associate now with, um, with a particular disease condition, um, is Fusobacterium necrophorum. So, easy to identify in the lab, gram-negative pleomorphic rods. Uh, if you have a UV lamp, that's also very useful. Uh, it does fluoresce nicely yellow and has a bald cabbage odor. Um, indole and lipase positive, which again is easy to, um, to test for and um, help you to identify. Has a, a number of virulence mechanisms, endotoxin, lipase, several adhesins, Hemolysin, which makes it a, a really um, potent uh, organism. Uh, and the, the particular uh, disease it causes uh, was first identified by um, Lemire uh, in 1936, and he published this um, paragraph in, in The Lancet, uh, suggesting that um, anyone who came across this uh, would, it would be very, um, it would be very easy to spot this particular set of of, uh, of symptoms, um, such that it was unmistakably uh, this uh, caused by this um, this organism, and um, you know people should be aware of it. Uh, despite this, we we still have cases published in the literature uh, where where the diagnosis hasn't been made. So we do uh, we do think it's important to keep. Um, making sure everybody's aware of this organism. In particular, it has an association with uh, the young adults um, with, and, and it starts with um, patients with an acute sore throat. And this is just an example of a, of a classical case of Lemier's disease, uh, following a path through, through sort of um, contacting a GP, um, perhaps, you know, rightfully or wrongly not being given antimicrobials, um, and then f developing uh, further symptoms, uh, ending up in in A and E, uh, and the recovery time um, was very uh, you know long in this in this process. So it can affect healthy young adults, and uh, we should be aware of this thrombophlebitis of the jugular vein. That's a key uh, sign of this of this particular disease, uh, as is the the abscesses that form in lungs, liver, joints, and other areas. So in terms of uh, actinomycosis, uh, the most common organism is actinomyces israeli. Uh, and what's particular about this uh, particular organism is that it does require extended culture. So you will not culture this organism in a few days. It does require up to 10 days. Um, on on specialist selective vega, or it will grow um, perfectly fine on fastidious anaerobega, and um, it's gram positive bacillus. Um, but they, they not all the actinomyces do branch. But it is important to note that it's inherently metronidazole resistant, uh, and that they may some may not grow on neomycin aga. Uh, actinomycosis. Uh, Several different areas it can it can affect. So there's the thoracic, um, abdominal, or pelvic, and, and there are other other areas as well. Um, but those three are probably the most um, the most common. Um, in terms of the actual bugs, Actinomyces israeli uh, or Grenchrai are the two most common true causes of actinomycosis. The others here with question marks um, are involved less commonly. Uh, and then there are other infections caused by this group of organisms uh, that um, are more sort of skin or abscess organisms 
Um, so the pathogenesis is is similar to TB interaction. They initiate a foreign body response from the immune system, and they, they, this makes them difficult to treat because um, they form these uh, these dense filamentous micro colonies, um, and they're protected from the host response. So in summary, clinically, vaccinomycosis uh, is a chronic, uh, slowly progressing disease, difficult to diagnose, it requires prolonged therapy, um, and mainly cervicofacial, so 60% of cases cervicofacial, 20% thoracic, 20% found in the abdominal pelvic area, and relapse of treatment failure is common, and they are um, can be fatal if not treated. So that brings me to the end of the um, the talk. Uh, if you do require any further information or want to attend any training, we do provide an annual two-day workshop, uh, Practical and Clinical Microbiology of Anaerobes in the reference unit in Cardiff. Um, and we do have uh, a conference in July this year that uh, people can attend. It's on the Microbiology um, Society website. So please do come along. There's several lectures there that would be of interest. Uh, and there's a subgroup in the um, ESCMID uh, European um, group specifically looking at anaerobic infections, the um, ESCI group. So uh, thank you for listening um, and I will leave you with this quote. So it was provided by a colleague um, a few years ago now. Uh, thank you very much.